So guys, we're here again. Our last video, only a few weeks away from the greatest change in the marine industry, or at least in our generation. IMO 2020, sulfur is the hot topic. And here we are playing pool on a table that is made of sulfur concrete. So, I'll break. So with only a few weeks, um, still some challenges in the implementation basically. What do you guys see? Well, I think the big question that people are asking themselves of course is what's availability going to be like? What's price going to be like? Uh, how's it all going to play out? Uh, because there, of course there, are, there is a lot of stuff we know about the general picture. Right. But as a ship operator you're really focused on what does it mean to me? What are the specifics for my vessels? Uh, and and that, that becomes uh, more thorny to, uh, to answer. Yeah, we see that uh, shipping companies are now uh, well uh, preparing for this. I think one of the main challenges is uh, the compatibility issue. Compatibility. Uh, compatibility. Okay. And uh, how do they plan their banking operations? Okay. Uh, how do you make sure that uh, you will have an almost empty tank in your banking? Yeah. Uh, how do you handle uh, fuels on board? Yeah. Uh, I think that's going to be very important. Make sure that you understand temperatures, uh, viscosities, uh, all the properties of the fuel, uh, to make sure that you avoid problems. Uh, so it's uh, understanding these things and understanding what types of fuel are going to be available in each location. <laughs> <Come on>. Pressure. <laughs> no pressure. No. Oh. Pressure. <laughs> pressure. No, but, uh, so you're saying challenges. What do you see? Because I know you guys have done a lot of uh, research in this sense, so it'll be interesting to see what you see in there. Yeah, like Chris just uh, mentioned, there's a lot about the compatibility issue because uh, with 0 0.5 we're getting into new fuel grades, as you know very, very well, of course, which are very, very different from what we've been Correct, using yeah, in ships before. Absolutely. Uh, and even though there's a lot of industry guidance out there from uh, many different sources, uh, you still need to actually apply that to your bunkering uh, practices. How and, do you and translate how that? How do you do exactly. that on your ship? How do you maintain segregation with operational constraints? Yeah. But I, I think the maritime industry has shown a tremendous capacity to learn, actually. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look. One of the things I always find interesting is, for me, that this industry has to change mindset. If you look at the ship's ecosystem, it's not only the fuel is going to have to change, like you say, we're moving from fuel procurement to fuel, fuel management, but there's a lot of stakeholders that have to be involved, tanks have to change, and on the lubricant side as well. Um, obviously, we know that, lucky Luca, we know that, <laughs> we know that um, thing, things have changed yeah. and that the, the lower sulfur level is going to mean a, a difference in the chemistry of the lubricants as well. So Christos, I know you guys have done a lot of research in terms of the users of the ship implementation plan um, and for the vessels to plan. Are there any insights you've got that you can share from, from what we have? What is uh, interesting is uh, that uh, we also hear some concerns about uh, the new lubricants not okay. protecting the engines as uh, good as the old ones and uh, maybe there's a need for more frequent inspections. Yeah, so, so that would be something very interesting to... I mean, from, from our perspective, see, we formulated lubricants and marine lubricants for 50, 60 years with uh, the Mobile Guard brand. And we've been planning for, for IMO 2020 on the lubricant side for nice well, over, well over five years. So ever since that first eco was, was introduced and that reduced BN, um, but the need for additional, what we call neutral detergency to be in the package to make sure that those engines still have that, that cleanliness and have that condition is something that I know especially we've worked to make sure is the case. Mm -hmm. But yeah, to your point, I don't think, I don't think we're gonna get away from the need to monitor the condition of the cylinder islands, the piston and the engine, exactly. the engine as a whole. I think that's only gonna get more and more prevalent. We have a, a source of data from our mobile surf cylinder condition monitoring service. So yeah. we, we're able to digitize that data system. And what we found when we did the latest dive was that only 25% of vessels are optimally lubricated. That's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised to be honest because you, doing condition monitoring, doing new world analysis, doing particle analysis, all of that, it's kind of a, I'm not going to say esoteric profession, but yeah. it's not, not something that people normally do. It's, you, you find it more in the offshore sector where yeah, the, the money is uh, more, more available, I guess. Have you seen already um, customers uh, switching to the new lubricants? 
Yeah, so again, in line with their fuel switching, we've seen customers pick up mainly in those in those bigger ports, um, but we have seen a large pickup on on our Mobile Guard 540, which is the 40 BN cylinder oil. But then also interestingly is on the medium speed, so on the four stroke side, so your route to compliance doesn't only dictate your cylinder oil choice, it dictates your, your four stroke engine oil choice as well. So we've mm -hmm. seen a lot more uptake in our 20 BN product. Right. So M420 where that's been again designed for that 0.5 use. So again, the engine oils and the cylinder oils both have a part to play in making yeah. sure you, you meet that compliance. Yeah. And that's a very good sign that um, uh, owners and operators are already preparing not yeah. only the fuel tanks but also the lube oil. Good shot. Good shot. And what do you think about enforcement? There's a lot of discussion as usual about enforcement. Will this be enforced? Will the enforcement be uniform across the world, etc.? It's, it's a complicated question. Uh, right. with a complicated answer, of course. Of course. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, it will be enforced. Uh, every country who's a party to uh, Annex 6 of Marpol, and that covers roughly 90% of the tonnage of the world, yeah. is obliged to enforce. Yeah. But the thing is that they take this into their own national legislation. Right. Uh, the IMO doesn't set any kind of fine level or criteria for detention or anything like that. That's up to each individual country to, do, to deal with it as it is fit. So, yeah, I mean, it's sport, state and flag. Yeah, so, so we, and, and flags are not really going, they'll be involved in enforcement, but it's really about sport state when it comes to yeah. the inspections and all that. So we'll be getting a, a non-uniform picture. You'll be seeing strict enforcement in uh, Europe, in, uh, certainly in North America. Uh, Singapore. Singapore, of course, obviously. Um, uh, but other parts of the world, it may be uh, a little bit less stringent, at least uh, at least initially. Um, we'll see how it plays out. Um, but betting on lax enforcement is what I would call a very a much a high-risk strategy. Yeah, you don't you don't you don't want to do that because it, you will see a rigid enforcement. It also brings us to the issue of the, the, of the sampling, the testing, the analysis yeah. of fuel samples because Absolutely. you. Absolutely. The, the produce that will be provided will be right on, 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 on the knife edge. Yeah, I mean, there, there are very clear guidance in terms of uh, suppliers and whoever is making this product available need to think about specifically on the salt. Uh, the joint industry guidelines talk yeah. extensively about that. Even the public available specification from ISO has some reference. So, um, yeah, it, that's the reason why preparedness for me has always been the I'm thing sure. that this industry has to have. And it brings, us, it brings us into this whole issue of what you talked about, about tank cleaning, about pipe cleaning. But it's, it's, just, just, it's not just a question of taking a load of compliance fuel, because it, yeah. what you then burn is going to be picking up from the previous uh, fuel loads. Absolutely. So Absolutely. You, can, you can, inadvertent non-compliance is a term that we've been talking about a lot. Yeah. And we don't want to get there. <laughs> so preparedness is really key to, to that whole issue. I have a no idea though what the fine levels are going to be if you get into uh, i mean one thing is deliberately taking 2.5 percent when you're not yeah. you blatant non-compliance exactly yeah. but if you're at 0 0.53 56 how are you going to be treated by port state control well I, I am always very clear in that sense it says that the port state will gather all the evidences look at your preparedness so at the end of the day, again, it goes back to preparedness. How you can demonstrate how prepared you've been, all the effort that you've done in order to be, to be ready. Um, and in terms of fines, we know the fines are different across the world. I mean, Marshall Island is a flag state. It's gone up to $1 million for non-compliance. Yeah. In the US, $20,000 per day. In Singapore, there are discussions about the tension yeah. of the vessel. So it, it's not going to be uniform because of the way the legislation is ratified and brought in into the country legislation, but it will be severe. And that's just the monetary effect. Then there is the whole reputational issue. Yeah, and I think that one thing we need to bear in mind here is, of course, that when we talk about using extremely clean fuels, we're talking 0.1%, yeah. so yeah. it's a really, really clean fuel. Bear in mind that what you use for land transportation is a heck of a lot cleaner than that. 
And I am not sure if uh, the public at large, politicians of course, which represent them, are going to, in the long term, uh, be willing to accept that ships operating in municipal areas are going to be allowed to emit more than trucks or cars operating in municipal areas. I see a long-term trend driving towards even stricter uh, regulations on, the, on this, not necessarily driven by the IMO, but driven locally and regionally and maybe even by port, port municipalities. So let's talk about one of the things that we still get asked and one of the things, I think there's still some confusion, carriage ban. That's a very good uh, topic and that uh, I think we should make very clear what the carriage ban is and what it is not. Anyway, it is not. Maybe exactly. let's start with that. It is not a grace period. Right. Um, the carriage ban um, starts on March 1st, 2020. And after that day, you're not allowed to carry any high sulfur for fuel oil on board unless, it's, uh, unless you have a scrubber yep. installed on the vessel. Uh, but even though the, the, the carriage ban comes into effect on the 1st of March, yeah. from the 1st of January, you're not allowed to use that fuel anyway, even if it's on board. Unless you have a scrubber. Unless course. you have a scrubber installed. Of what that means is that if you uh, have some high sulfur fuel oil on board after the 1st of January, it will right. be up to you to prove to the port authorities that you did not use the fuel. And how do you do that? Uh, based on uh, the logs. The, the logs and the, the BDN. The, yeah. the logs and the BDN. The BDN is actually what is proving um, what is the fuel quality that you're using. You cannot uh, mix this fuel with uh, low sulfur fuel to make a compliant uh, mix or blend on board. Uh, because the port authorities are going to check the bank and delivery now. So if you have 300 tons left on board on the 1st of January, you need to manage that 300 tons? Before, you need to manage it before the 1st of January, otherwise you have two months to get rid of it. And then there will be probably a cost associated with that. Uh, a so cost, cost in addition to the money you've already paid for that bunker fuel. For the bunker fuel, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And in, I mean, this is a really important point because in some uh, corners of the world there are misunderstandings that these two months somehow represent a grace period where, you're not, where you are allowed to burn what's, what's on board. And that's definitely not the case. And I actually yeah, had right. commercial people calling me to ask you this question because they've had people providing tonnage who've been saying that, well, yes, you can burn it during the grace period. There is no, There's such, no thing. such thing as a no, grace period. There, yeah, there, there absolutely. Isn't. So uh, people got to understand that you, you have the rest of this year to get rid of your non-compliant fuel. Otherwise, you're going to, it's going to cost you money. It's exactly the same situation on the lubricant side as well. Yeah. If you think if you have that higher sulfur fuel oil on board right now and you're going to move to 0.50 compliant, your, from your BN standpoint, you're going to either go from a, a 70 yeah. BN or 100 BN, likely down to that 40 BN. So you need to manage those stocks of 70 and 100 on board to make sure you have you have minimal minimal left when you need to use that that, uh, that lower level yeah. of sulfur. Fortunately, what? there is no requirement to debunker the non-compliant uh, no, non no, no, lubricant. No, yeah, exactly. but there are there are performance issues related exactly. to that on board. So you, you don't want have, to you run. To you don't want to run that, that high BN on the on the low sulfur, we know from experience, again from the ECAs, that you're going to have deposits, you're going to have issues around those piston rings and those piston crowns, and whilst that's more of a, a slower issue than corrosion, it, it still has an impact on the bottom line. How long do you have before you change your lubricants from the moment you start using compliant fuels? We would recommend as soon as, soon as possible, you need to manage your fuel transition with your lubricants transition. So again, going back to what we were talking about around the, the formulation of lubricants, you can't, or we are, we're recommending not to mix where possible. So mm -hmm. talking around that neutral detergency. Yeah. Very good. Here he is. Talking around that neutral detergency, even if you just mix the appropriate ratio of a 25 and a 70 to get 40, the performance is not going to be there. Exactly. So, 0.50% sulfur compliant fuel, it's what the majority of the industry will use, but it's just the majority. There are other choices that some chip owners have made. That's correct. Uh, uh, one choice that we heard a lot about in the last uh, year, year and a half is uh, scrubbers. Okay. And uh, we expect to have uh, roughly 3,000 sifting scrubbers in um, early 2020. And that will take about 15% of the marine fuel consumption. 
because that's a on a, typically on a, larger vessels. On a ship basis or a volume basis? On a volume, volume basis. Volume basis. That's going to be roughly 15% of fuel consumption out of coming out of roughly 3,000 ships. Another another route that we hear we heard on about when speaking to customers is is LNG, so liquefied natural gas. Are there any statistics or insights you have from from the market? Yes, uh, there are uh, currently uh, 170 ships in operation and uh, another 160, 170 on order. Okay. So LNG is not going to be the main means of compliance for existing vessels. But what we see is that for new for new buildings, uh, many owners they are considering LNG seriously when they are placing orders. And what we see changing now is that we see moving from small vessels, for example, uh, small passenger ferries or offshore supply vessels, now moving to uh, very large container vessels, cruise ships, yep. uh, oil tankers, uh, starting using LNG as a fuel. And this is the big change we see in the future. And also we see that in most new building uh, projects, LNG is considered, not necessarily selected, but considered, of the criteria. considered seriously as an option. 2020 is not even the past, it's the present and everything that we've done, you've done, ship owners, yeah. overall the stakeholders led us to up today. Still few urban myths. Do the new 0.50% compliant fuels have a specification? Well, they, you have the ISO specification, you have the publicly available specification, the past that's just now, that's supposed to cater to certain commingling and blending issues. Uh, you always need to manage your fuels. Uh, yeah. Shipping companies have done that for time immemorial. The, mingling, the management challenge uh, is probably increased somewhat, but it's, it's uh, not as if it's a paradigm shift. Global sulfur cap is not going to be enforced. Oh, that's uh, definitely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we have to think that uh, it's uh, only a few weeks to go before enforcement day. Uh, now it's uh, very late, even if there was any um, political will to do that, there is simply no time. And uh, the, the industry is already almost ready. People are already using the compliant fuels today. Uh, yeah. It's very difficult to go back. I think maybe from your perspective, are you ready to provide high sulfur fuel? When you formulate 0.50% sulfur compliant fuel, it's a very different way to run a big machine like this. Exactly. So um, our choice, has been very clear based on the feedback from ship owner. Ship owner indicated that the main compliance option at the time, which became a choice, was 0.50% sulfur compliant fuel. All right. Wow. No pressure, Joe. You can do it. Yeah, and he could. Oh, and he could. <laughs> Good, Good game. Good for you. Well done. Good game. Good game, guys. Good game. Thank uh, you. We are prepared. The industry is prepared. Thank you very much for having this game with us and sharing your knowledge, experience, and insight. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.